talking about GLN or more generally a split um, group. Um, uh, I talked about the Borel subgroup for GLN of upper triangular matrices, but there's a similar, as I mentioned last time, there's a similar group for any split group. And um, um, they're all conjugate to each other, so you can take, you can fix one. Um, so uh, in any case, um, the, uh, the unramified representations come by inducing a, a very elementary uh, representation on the Borel subgroup, namely just a character governed by the values it takes on the diagonal matrices. And that in turn is governed by an n tuple of Z1 up to Zn of complex numbers. Um, so uh, this is really quite concrete. The unramified representations then are, are, uh, are really quite simple. And so, um, so in a, uh, uh, if you have an unramified representation, um, which we were denoting by a pi p u, it's an unramified representation. Of G Q P and that maps bijectively um, to a conjugacy class C pi P um, U equals P to the minus U one P to the minus U N zero zero zero. Um, um, regarded, so this is an n tuple of complex numbers built out of this n tuple of complex numbers u1 up to un that we started with, and you take, you don't literally take it to be this diagonal matrix, but rather uh, the collection, uh, the equivalence class of diagonal matrices uh, given by the conjugacy class of this thing, in other words, by all possible permutate, permutations, so up to Uh, permutation. By anything in the symmetric group. Okay, so um, I, I will still say um, um, that's a bijection. This is a bijection. Unramified representations are bijective with these things. I've built this data out of the n tuples of complex numbers that gave me the induced the character and the induced representation. So um, I'm going to say just a few more. So now we're almost ready to start the, the sort of really big conjectures that were in Langland's book, uh, his article. But uh, I want to say a couple more things about these unramified representations. They, they also come up as operators. And um, uh, uh, so I'm going to call this uh, exercises. Um, and um, I'm not sure that um, you want to, unless you're sort of familiar with this stuff, I don't know, you want to maybe not want to go through these exercises. When I say exercises, I mean, maybe look them up <laughs> somewhere. And I think I didn't check, but I think most of these things would be in the early pages of the Corvallis conference. And so these are uh, these are exercises in what are called Hecke algebras. So these unramified representations, you of course are familiar with the term Hecke, or you have heard the term Hecke operators. Um, they come from these unramified representations. They're, they're kind of out, they're more or less amount to the same thing. And so uh, uh, to start things off, um, prove. So consult it, so, so prove. And I'll say consulting relevant literature as needed. I wouldn't want to have to give you a proof of this right off the board, but they're not difficult. Um, well, um, 
uh, these p-adic groups. Oh, so we're so this is where um, let's let's suppose for this this discussion that g equals gln. These things all have analogs for more general split groups that are quite straightforward to uh, um, describe. But for gln, uh, so gln, um, this is um, uh, there are properties that come from linear algebra on real matrices, real n by n matrices, and they also apply to p-adic matrices. Namely, GQP can be written uh, uniquely, um, uh, no, not quite uniquely, but um, as BQP, that's the Borel subgroup of upper triangular matrices, times KP. Okay, so this is um, BQP, um, GLM, ZP. So any, uh, any element in um, um, uh, GQP can be written as an upper triangular matrix times an integral matrix. And so that's, uh, it's called the Iwasawa decomposition for real groups. And um, it, uh, another way to, in more element, I mean, you, you're probably, some of you are probably TAing the linear algebra courses. And so orthonormal bases for n by n matrices, to get from one orthonormal basis to another one, you have something called the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process, um, whereby you can, this is an algorithm to actually get you from one orthonormal basis to another one. Well, if you think about what that really means, it says that, that um, two bases are related by, um, orthogonal or not, are related by, uniquely by um, a general linear matrix. So, um, uh, if you think, if you just uh, sort out what the Gram-Schmidt process means, it is exactly this for real groups, an upper triangular matrix times an orthogonal matrix. So it's, it's called, for general real groups, it's called the Iwasawa decomposition. Another one that is relevant, uh, that you can write any element in GQP as a product of K P times a diagonal matrix and the diagonal matrix can consist of um, uh, the, uh, non-compact entries, uh, non-integral entries times K P. And so this for real groups is another one. Yes. That's right. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. That's the maximal compact subgroup um, of the p-adic group, and uh, it plays exactly the same role as uh, the orthogonal group does for real groups. So this is an exact analog of the Iwasawa decomposition or the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process. Um, for the p-adic group and, and you can either you can either i think you i guess you can either you can even uh, write it as gram schmidt i mean you can prove this the same way as you do the orthogonalization probe um, can, can i write this can i write glm as the two points of the actual orthogonal group as like all no no you can't so that's that's the big difference so the maximal compact subgroup of a p-adic group is an open subgroup of the p-adic group, and it's not an algebraic group. It's a group over the integers. It's the integer points. The maximal compact subgroup of a real group is an algebraic subgroup, the orthogonal group. It is closed, but uh, it's not open. It's, it's a, a, a subgroup of uh, finite co-dimension. So that's the difference. That's one of the big differences between p-adic groups and real groups. 
the maximal compact subgroup is an open compact subgroup because you have these, uh, these uh, integral points. And for real groups, it's the special ortho an orthogonal group for, for GLN. And so what's so, I, I suppose, is astonishing um, is that all there's so many things in common between the two when on the surface they really look quite different. Okay, um, now I tried to, what I'll do, there's a little combinatorial problem here on the blackboards, which I think I solved. Yeah, so you can do that, and then I can slide that up when I want to go to the board. Yes, yes. This is for G being split. Uh, can you, you uh, that's right, yes. Uh, if G is not split, let me think about it. Um, um, the second one works too, I think, but... Um, uh, so, so if it's even, even if it's split, you have to be careful about diagonal matrices. What you need to do for GL for a split group is you have to take a maximal split torus, and um, so it's something in a maximal split torus. Um, um, yes, for the split for the first one, it's the, you take a minimal parabolic instead of the Borel subgroup. Pardon me? Yes, it should. Yes, it should. Yes, it should. Um, I didn't think about that, but I, I think that's, that's correct. Um, Pardon me? Can you not make a field extension so that it's if it's yes, if it's quasi split, that 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 means that the minimal parabolics that the Borel subgroup, which normally is not defined over the ground field, is defined. So that's that's the uh, an equivalent condition for it to be quasi split is the has a Borel subgroup. Split means it, has, it is stronger. It means that you can have a maximal torus which is is split. Uh, I don't know if I've answered your question, but. Uh, um, Maybe I can think of it while I'm, I'm doing the other, these other things. Okay, in any case, that gives some idea of the structure of, uh, of the piadic group. And um, so, so, so this, these things have some consequences. Show directly. Uh, that, okay, I think our notation last time was, um, suppose Pi P is the, is the induced representation. So Pi P U tilde, the one that uh, could conceivably be reducible, have several reducible constituents. Um, but the assertion is um, that the subspace um, which I could write as V P U um, KP. So we were writing VPU for the subspace of the induced representation. So this would be uh, the, set, the vectors phi in VPU um, such that pi tilde uh, PU of K um, uh, phi equals phi. Um, this would be for every K and KP. Okay, so we're asking for um, in this space of the induced representation, this is meant to be, I can't remember if I had a tilde on it, but that's the space of the fully induced representation. I don't think I did have a tilde, not that it. Um, so, um, but you can still ask for uh, the subspace of that uh, induced um, representation space, which um, when you restrict the representation to K, the maximal compact subgroup, it leaves the vectors invariant. You can still uh, look for that, ask for that subspace. So this is, this, is, uh, this is related to what I stated without proof before, but is a one-dimensional 
um, is one dimensional. Um, so that pi p u, that's the uh, sub representation of pi p u tilde uh, that contains that vector, is in fact the unique. So this would be part of the proof of what I, something that I stated last time the unique unramified constituent. Of um, IP U tilde. All right, um, three. So um, we have just been talking about representations and sub-representations attached to the notion of being um, unramified. Um, but now let's talk about operators um, because these things um, come with what um, in modular forms are called the HECA operators. And uh, so uh, where do they, how do they appear here? In this more general situation, well, let me define um, H K P. So this is uh, going to be something contained in the general linear p-adic group. Uh, let's take this to be the set of functions H P, uh, compactly supported functions um, um, in G. QP. So um, it's actually, um, yes, these are continuous compactly supported. So since we're dealing with complex valued functions, and we're dealing with a to on, defined on a totally disconnected group. If you ask that they be continuous and be compactly supported, it means they take only finitely many values. So this is the same thing as compactly supported functions that take only finitely many values. Okay, so again, that's a completely different thing. I mean, for real groups, you always uh, you do a lot. A lot of what you're doing is analysis, you're taking c infinity c of g or um, um, of g r um, smooth functions of compact support. Uh, well, this is the analog of that for a p-adic group, and it looks much simpler. Just the set of compactly supported functions that take only finitely many values. Is that clear? If it's a totally disconnected group, it's um, and it's continuous. And then if it goes into the reals then uh, every around every element that function has got to be locally constant in a small neighborhood around that point and since it's compactly supported the small open neighborhoods there's only going to be finitely many of them does that, does that make sense yeah so uh, this would be the set of hp some compactly smooth um, uh, 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 compactly supported continuous functions but I'm going to ask for more. I'm going to ask that HP K1, X, K2 be equal to HP of X. For every X in GQP and K1 and K2 in K. P, the group of integral points. So I'm asking for bi-invariant smooth functions of compact support, that is to say, locally con uh, uh, compactly supported, locally constant functions. Uh, but I'm looking for more than that. I'm asking that they be left and right invariant under translation by K. So uh, by uh, the polar decomposition, it means these functions 
are determined com uh, completely by their uh, values on the diagonal matrices. Okay, so that's, uh, this is what's called, um, let's see, I push this up. No, I gotta start writing here, excuse me. Okay, so uh, this is called the HECA operator, he well, this is called the HECA algebra. on GQP. Algebra. Well, it's an algebra. Um, there's a multiplication on it, but it's the usual thing that you do when you are talking about representations, say, of a locally compact group. You can either talk about a representation of the group, or you can talk about a representation of the group algebra. It's like for, for finite groups, you can talk about a representation of a finite group or equivalently, a representation of its group algebra. Well, a group algebra for a Lie group is the space of L1 functions on the group um, under convolution. So we're not taking L1 there, we're taking a subalgebra of that, but relevant multiplication as it is. So the multi mul as one sees immediately, the multiplication for the group algebra of a finite group is convolution. Uh, of functions on that finite group. And uh, that's what we're dealing with here as well. So this is that H1, uh, HP, convolution HP prime, um, is the function whose value at X is equal to the integral over G QP, HP Y, HP, prime y to the minus one x dy. So it's an algebra under this multiplication convolution. So it's an abelian algebra under convolution, and uh, it's got to have, I guess, I guess you could, um, well, uh, so that's the definition, and then, um, oh, I guess, so, I guess this, if this is to be an exercise, then this is, Trivial exercise, I guess, but uh, prove prove this is an abelian algebra. And that, first of all, prove it's an algebra and abelian algebra. And then finally, um, uh, so four, prove that if, um, if pi p, um, is any irreducible representation um, unitary, let's say, GQP, um, um, on a space VP, um, and HP is an element in this Hecke algebra, AP, um, then the operator um, pi p of HP. So this is pi p is a representation of the group. So here we're what we're really doing is taking the corresponding representation of this group algebra, or this let's say subalgebra of the full group algebra. And so that's by definition the integral 
um, of GQP of HP Y pi of Y dy. So we have this operator on VP. So this is this is pretty straightforward. So prove that it vanishes on VP. Prove that it vanishes. Um, um, vanishes on the orthogonal complement. Um, um, of the space, uh, so the orthogonal complement um, of the space of k invariant vectors on VP. So V pi p is a representation of G on a space VP, and we can restrict that representation to kp and look at the subrepresentation of uh, vec the subspace of vectors that are invariant under kp. So I take v vp kp, that's supposed to be the set of vectors in vp, um, such that pi p k, k v equals v for every k and kp. This is asking one to furnish proofs of this, a lot of the things that I mentioned. Well, it's related to the things that we were talking about last time. So the assertion is prove that um, on the orthogonal complement, the unitary representation, um, uh, it, it's you've got this sub representation, and prove that on the orthogonal complement of it, this representation. Um, vanishes. So in other words, it's completely determined by its restriction to this, the KP invariant vectors. And then finally, um, um, so this one, I guess, does involve a little bit more, but um, and you don't have to do this, but uh, if you want to, this one involves um, a little research. In the literature. Show that. There is um, a canonical. Isomorphism HP into a function I'm going to. So this is HP. Um, this is a function um, in the Hecke algebra. So that's in HKP. And then um, I'm going to say, say that there's an isomorphism from this Hecke algebra to a, a function that I'm going to write HP hat, and it's going to be a function defined on n tuples of complex numbers. So z equals z1, zn, this is in C star to the n. This is where G is equal to GLN. So show, show there's a canonical isomorphism from here to here. Um, this is called the Sataki isomorphism. So one can look that up. Some people get mad if you call it the Sataki isomorphism. Castleman gets mad. They, oh, I shouldn't be saying that. I shouldn't be saying this. I'm, on, I'm being broadcast, but. Uh, uh, in any case, uh, that this is the most common word for it, the uh, Sataki isomorphism um, from the algebra. Um, 
H um, uh, KP um, onto an algebra um, uh, it uh, I'm just going to I'm not going to describe the algebra but it's an it's a natural algebra um, of SN invariant functions Um, um, on CN such that well uh, it fits into what we've been talking about before. It has the property of pi p u um, of h p is equal to h p hat of c p u. This thing n u in c n and the h p in h KP. So uh, I haven't said what the range of it is, but uh, one could ask, um, uh, identify the range or identify what space of functions does it map onto, identify um, the image. of this isomorphism and um, um, and so I don't know if you took if you're familiar with the spectral theorem but it's very closely related to the spectral theorem and so uh, Now I haven't um, defined this map. I'm saying that there is a map. What actually you do is you take this. Uh, I'm just going to say it. I won't. Uh, I won't. Um, I, I won't write it down. But you take this function H P in the functions that are K by invariant um, uh, on G L uh, N. So to be got k by invariant by the polar decomposition, it means they're completely determined on the diagonal matrices. And what you do on the diagonal matrices with this restricted function to get this, you take its Fourier transform. So Z, uh, it, uh, you really do take the Fourier transform of this function on the diagonal matrices. Um, uh, I, I'm, uh, that's not quite correct. Uh, you um, have to um, take this function on the diagonal matrices. You then have to integrate it by an upper triangle, multiply it by an upper triangular matrix with ones on the diagonal and integrate over that uh, upper triangular matrix and then take the Fourier transform. So, uh, in any case, it's a natural isomorphism that um, is very much like the spectral theorem, and um, uh, if, if you like, you can just look up under the Sataki isomorphism. It is, uh, for example, described in the Boulder Conference, which is the earlier uh, symposia, the earlier uh, um, symposia of pure mathematics. It took place 12 years, I guess, before the uh, Corvallis conference. But the point is that uh, this Hecke algebra, the bi-invariant functions, um, K bi-invariant functions on the group, can either be thought of as a convolution algebra as they stand, or this is an algebra that is defined by multiplication. 
it, it's, it's very much like the Fourier transform, where con, a Fourier transform of a convolution is uh, the product of the Fourier transforms. And this, uh, the product here, um, the convolution here, uh, gets mapped to the product there. And um, it, it is very much like the Fourier transform. And it's a, the image is functions, basically functions in Z, which are entire. All right, so that gives, the, this is behind um, the classical definition of PECA operators. Um, so there's really two things. There's um, unramified representations of p-adic groups, and then there's uh, an equivalent thing um, of, there's an operator algebra that's related to them, and the operator algebra is just uh, the analog uh, of the thing that you do when group representations, instead of talking about a representation of the group, you talk about a representation of its group algebra. And so this is the analog of an unramified representation when you think of it as a representation um, of its group algebra. And those really are the HECA operators um, in a much more general setting than one has for um, um, then one has, uh, <laughs> I was working on a problem here and uh, it's uh, addled me, it's addled me, I'm a little, uh, I didn't get it solved, it was it's something quite different from this and I won't trouble you with it, but any, in any case, um, uh, that is the background for unramified representations when you think of them in terms of uh, representations of the analog of the group algebra of that convolution Hecke algebra. Okay, so with that, we can go back to um, um, we can go back to representations of Adele groups and to really uh, single out what is makes them so interesting and important. Yes, I am. Pardon me. Um, the classical definition, uh, it, one has to go through these two steps, which I haven't done. Um, uh, classical automorph modular forms are functions on the upper half plane, which behave under left translation by SL2Z in a well-defined way with a factor of automorphy. Now there's a way to go from that to functions on SL2R, which trends, which are invariant on the left uh, by gamma, by SL2Z, but on the right uh, transform in a certain way uh, under SO2. And it's the representation of SO2 that corresponds to the weight of the modular form. I, I suppose I could have spent a week actually describing these two things, but I, I'm not. Um, um, uh, so, uh, and then the second step is to go from there to representations on GL. So we're talking about GL2 in the case of classical modular forms. So representations of GL2 are, which occur in L2 of GL2R modulo SL2Z, or some congruent subgroup to relate those to representations on GL2A, which are by and which are actually to get the exact things that you get for uh, classical modular forms. You make it invariant under the p-adic places at uh, on the right. Uh, um, uh, okay, <laughs> uh, so uh, L2 of um, SL2R modulo SL2Z uh, then itself transforms into L2 of uh, SL2A over SL2Q, but that latter thing is, is much bigger. Uh, but what you have to do is to divide out on the right by SL2ZP for all P. You take the product of all P over all P of the maximal compact subgroups um, SL2ZP 
of uh, GL2 QP. So you have um, so you have L2 um, of um, SL2R. So I'm going to. This really is better stated for SL2 rather than GL2 because S, the GL2 has a center that uh, it's SL2 that really those are that's the group of matrices uh, with determinant one and SL2. Um, let's say SL2 uh, uh, Z. Well, that is exactly the same. Uh, so, so there's two steps. The step to go from classical modular forms to this. This is in Burrell's article. Might have been clearer if I'd done this, but it would have taken a week. This is Burrell. Um, it's, he has about two or three articles right at the beginning of the Boulder Conference, the 1965 um, Symposia of Pure Mathematics. And it's, it, it says that classical modular forms are the same thing as this if you um, choose a subspace of this consisting of not just uh, functions on SL2R modulo this, but functions on here which tra also transform on the right um, by the maximal compact subgroup of SL2R is SO2, which is just the unit circle. And its representations are parametrized by the integers. And you take uh, the representation of SL2O, the, the maximal compact subgroup, which is parametrized, say, by 2M. And then that, if you, if you take that, this really is identical to the space of classical modular forms of weight 2M. Does that make sense? I'm, does that make sense? That's how you get from here to here. And then this thing is the same thing as SL2 uh, Q, P, Q, Q, SL2 A. And then I'm going to write K um, finite. Um, and so maybe, uh, maybe I'll just write it as K0, K0. Is, the mat, is a open compact subgroup of the finite Adels. This is the product over all P of um, SL2 ZP. Okay, this is the maximal compact subgroup of uh, the P addict. So this is contained in the product over all P, uh, the restricted direct product of, over all P of SL to QP, and that's contained in SL2A. Okay, so this is a subgroup of this, and so this is a maximal compact subgroup of this, not maximal compact there. We've already, um, uh, we've already treated ourselves to asking that these things be behave in a certain way under translation by the maximal compact subgroup of SL2R. So what we do over here, and so, so that's understood that we're taking the subalgebra, uh, uh, the subspace of functions that behave under uh, a given weight uh, relative to SLSO2R. Uh, but now we go over to here, and there's another, there's some more compact subgroups, the maximal piatic compact subgroups. And so then we say, okay, well, let's just make an invariant under all of those things too. And if you do that, then this is exact, this is exactly the same as this. And we're talking about, uh, this is an impressionistic uh, talk. I mean, it's bet would have been better to write it all down, but we are talking about um, operators, uh, which I'm calling HECA operators. Um, given by the bi-invariant functions, um, Kp bi-invariant functions on SL2 Qp. Now, uh, uh, we are interested 
in this space, forget about for just uh, forget about uh, the smaller space given by invariant uh, invariance under a maximal compact subgroup of the p addicts, or transform a certain way under the maximal compact subgroup of the real group. We're talking about the regular representation of SL2A by right translation here. Um, now, if you take the Hecke operator at a given p adic place, it's going to act by right convolution on this space because that has at the p adic place, and that has uh, this, it's invariant under this thing. So, the, I don't know if this is all making sense, but it, it, it's, it's perfectly natural and it's very, very nice. It's very pretty. Um, the the p-adic Hecke algebra acts by right convolution on this space for any p. The p-adic Hecke algebra acts by right convolution on this by any p, and that is the Hecke operator in the classical modular form. So it really is the p this uh, um, this right convolution by the maximal compact subgroup is the is the classical Hecke operator. Um, uh, uh, these things are, because of the polar decomposition, they're completely determined on the diagonal matrices. And um, the diagonal matrices um, are multiplicative elements in the p-adic field. Um, but they're, it's not just, uh, they're still going to be invariant under the open compact subgroup of the uh, group of diagonal matrices. So these elements are going to be determined by an n-tuple of positive num p-adic numbers. And um, that, really is, that really is the same thing as what the Hecke operators do uh, on the, um, in classical modular forms. It's, uh, yeah, Malaurus. Yes. That, that, that's a good way to say it, yes. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to add something to what Malors said. Um, it, you have, you have um, um, this space is isomorphic to this space, if you choose right invariance under the real compact, uh, maximal real compact subgroup. And this is, isom is isomorphic to this space, if you mod out by the further p-adic space. So um, if you take right convolution by something in that Hecke algebra that I described over there on this space, and you go back and figure out what the steps were to identify this with this and this with this, this is what Mellor said, um, you get exactly, use convolution over here of that Hecke algebra, but you translate what it means if you uh, know exactly how to get from here to here and from here to here, you translate what that means over here, and it is exactly the definition of a classical Hecke operator, and it's a sum over double cosets, as Mellor has mentioned. What is, I, I gotta go, <laughs> I was hoping to, uh, what it really, what's good about this is um, we really, if we're taking a congruent subgroup 
over here, uh, rather than just SL2Z, then um, uh, finitely many, for finitely many primes, uh, it's not by invariant under K. And so there's no a traditional classical HECA operator for it. Um, uh, there is a definition of what happens uh, for, the, for this uh, case in the, in the classical case, but it's pretty murky. And here it's just right convolution by, uh, by piadic functions over here. So in other words, uh, there's, uh, there's a notion of a ramified HECA oper operator in the classical situation, and that is pretty murky. But it works out, but it's very natural here. It's just right convolution by a function on the piadic group that's not k by invariant. So uh, that's one reason why the adelic picture is, I mean, it's, it's equivalent, but it's, it's, it's a lot easier to work with the, the adelic picture than it is with the classical picture when you start talking about ramified and stuff. All right, so next time we're going to get, we'll get to the really big stuff for the Langlands, the Langlands conjectures. <laughs>